uh, before I get started. Hi, my name is Joe. Uh, I work at a company called Fastly, and it's important for you to know that my opinions are my own. Um, I am not an x86 expert, but I do know a little bit about x86. And since this is the networking track and we're going to talk about networking eventually, uh, before we can talk about networking, we need to talk a little bit about CPU caches. So the next couple slides are going to be maybe for some people uh, really like sort of basic information about CPU caches. But I want to start from there and then build up from that to talk about non-temporal writes in the networking stack after. So this is sort of like your typical memory hierarchy diagram you'd find on the internet. I just downloaded this from some random website. And all this is really trying to uh, explain is that there are different sizes of memory that have and that, that are at different speeds, right? So like at the very bottom of the diagram, you have very large disks that are very slow. And at the top of the diagram, you have things like CPU registers that are very small. Um, and just below CPU registers, you have your L1, L2, and L3 cache. Uh, and this is just to illustrate the idea that the CPU cache, the L1, L2, and L3 caches are very precious. Uh, they're very fast, but there's just not a lot of it to use. So you need to be careful with how you use it. Um, if you want to get a better understanding of the size of your caches on your system, you can run this command line tool on your Linux machine, LS Topo, and you can have it output a PNG file, which will show you what your CPU cache is and your CPU layout actually looks like. And I find this particularly helpful because I like looking at graphics. Um, this is an output of a graphic from a an AMD Zen 2 system that I have access to. And you can see in this diagram on the bottom, there are uh, four CPUs that are uh, dual core. And you can see that each of those uh, CPUs has an L1 data cache of 32K, an L2 cache of 512K. But all eight of the cores uh, here share a single 16 megabyte L3 cache. Um, so this is the type of output you'd get from running LS Topo, and this is really useful if you are trying to tune your application and trying to figure out like what sizes you want to use, different buffers and stuff. LS Topo will help give you an idea of the size of the caches on your system. So LS Topo is really dope. Um, so there are two important properties of data access patterns to remember to maximize the benefit of CPU cache. And this might seem like really, really basic, but I think it's really important to start with this and then build from this to talk about non-temporal writes later. So the two important properties to remember are spatial locality and temporal locality. And I'm gonna use a really common example that you've probably seen before um, if you took like a CS class in um, college or something. The standard uh, example of this is just your like two-dimensional array access in C, where you compare the access times of you know row major order versus column major order. And this is just like a really basic example, but I think this example really highlights like the two extremes actually really nicely. Um, when you're accessing a two-dimensional array in row major order, right, you're iterating through all the elements uh, across a row. And so you, you're getting spatial locality because each memory access uh, is ordered um, and so like you know the first access may be a cache miss but the following accesses will presumably be cache hits obviously depending on the size of what you're accessing and blah 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 and you're getting temporal locality because you're accessing those things uh, very quickly so there's a really good chance the data is still hot in the cache versus column major order where you're doing the opposite uh, where you're working against the CPU cache um, and the way this looks uh, in code is just really simple, right? Like you just have your two for loops and you're iterating across a row and then you have a column major order, the, you, know, you just flip them around. So now you're just accessing things along columns instead. And what this looks like graphically, again, I like pictures. Um, what this looks like graphically, if you look at row major order, every color change, uh, you can just assume it's a cache miss. So like in row major order, right, when you access the things in light blue, the first time you access it, it's a cache miss, and then the rest of those are cache hits. And then when you access the thing in green, it's a cache miss, and then the rest of the greens are cache hits and so on. And in column major order, you're constantly cache missing. Um, and so 
uh, you can run lots of like really interesting memory benchmarks using uh, an open source project called Tiny Membench that has lots of really interesting memory related benchmarks that use different instruction sequences and different sizes and access data differently to give you a re like a really interesting perspective on how your system performs with different access patterns and different um, x86 instructions and so on. Uh, I ran just a really simple micro benchmark just to highlight this point about you know uh, row major order versus column major order. Um, you can see this is just on the this you know this AMD Zen 2 machine that I had. I pinned this uh, sample program uh, to a particular CPU. When I ran it in row major order, it completed in 46,000 milliseconds, and when I ran it in column major order, it completed in 94,000 milliseconds. So you can see that row major order is obviously a lot faster. Um, and, you know, row major order is more than 2x faster because data accesses have spatial locality. You're accessing data that's near other data, right? So, like, your first uh, access is a miss, and then you pull the data in, and then you're accessing things that are now in the cache. Uh, and you also have temporal locality because it's a tight loop, and so you're accessing things uh, very quickly. The app is pinned to a CPU, so, you know, presumably the data is going to be in the L1 or L2 cache when you're accessing it. And so you get both of these two things. But what if we know that we don't need temporal locality? Um, uh, so if we know we don't need temporal locality, it'd be really nice to avoid the CPU cache evicting in-use data in exchange for data we know we won't touch again in the near future. Um, I'm going to repeat that just because, like, the first time I thought about this, it confused me. The idea is that, like, you have a program and you're going to touch data right now, but you know you're not going to touch it again in the near future. And so you don't want to disturb the contents of the CPU cache. Um, you don't want to evict data that you are using in your app in exchange for data that you know you're not going to use again for a while. And we're, we'll talk about like situations where this might occur later. Um, and if you're, you know, touching data that you're not expecting to use again in the near future, well, when you do that, the CPU cache is, is thrashed unnecessarily. Um, you know, useful data can be evicted from the cache in exchange for data where there is no locality benefit whatsoever. So it would be nice to avoid that. And using a set of instructions called non-temporal stores, you can actually write directly to RAM without disturbing the CPU cache. And on x86, there are a series of instructions you can use to do that. Here are some that you might see in the kernel um, or in other places uh, or in tiny membench. Like there are lots of places where these instructions pop up. And these things allow you to uh, write data directly to RAM without disturbing the contents of the CPU cache. So that's cool. Um, but what does that have to do with networking? Well, if you run ethool and you grep the output of ethool-k, you'll find this option called TX no cache copy. And the default is set to off. Um, and I was really curious about what this option is and what it's used for and why it was introduced. And so I went sort of deep down this rabbit hole of TX no cache copy and its origins. And it turns out that ethool allows you to enable no cache copies from user space on transmit. And I'm going to show you a diagram of what this means in both cases, when it's on or when it's off. So what does that mean to turn uh, TX no cache copy on or off? So let's start with the default, TX no cache copy off. When TX no cache copy is off, what happens is you have your, um, sorry, the animation didn't work, sadly. But um, basically, you have your data cache. Uh, which would all be green in the beginning. You have your user app. Your user app does a write to a network socket. That write does a copy into a kernel buffer. And then now that data that you're about to transmit on the network ends up in your CPU's cache. That's what the purple lines are at the top. Originally, those would all be green. Uh, but those that the data that you're about to transmit on the network uh, disturbs the CPU cache, lands in the CPU cache, and then you do a transmit uh, from the NIC. And you don't actually, you may not actually really want to do this because uh, you may not actually want to disturb the data in the CPU cache f in exchange for data that you're about to transmit on the network, right? Like you're writing this data out to the network, you're not expecting to touch it again, 
So why disturb the data in the CPU cache? Um, TX no cache copy on is exactly what you would use to avoid that from happening. So a diagram of TX no cache copy enabled, you have your user app, it does a, a write to uh, a TCP socket and it doesn't disturb the data that's in the CPU cache. So the data that's in the CPU cache stays there, you do this transmit to the network and everything is good. Um, so with uh, TX no cache copy enabled and assuming the kernel or the driver don't touch the data, the CPU cache is not disturbed. And um, this can lead to performance increases in certain situations. Um, important application data is kept in the cache and there's a reduction in memory bandwidth consumption. Uh, I looked up the when this was written and uh, who the author was. The original author was uh, Tom Herbert and this was added to the kernel back in uh, 2011. And in the commit message, there are some numbers which I added emphasis on myself so that to call them out more easily for you all to see. Uh, but you can see that um, in the commit message, Tom is explaining that the 95th percentile uh, tail latency was reduced significantly um, by using TX no cache copy. Um, and so the original author noted a 45% improvement in P95 times, which that's pretty cool. But um, this option only affects TCP. Uh, it's interface wide, so it affects every single connection um, on the interface. And it might be undesirable in some situations, like, I don't know, software KTLS, or if you're doing um, other operations that you might actually want data locality. Um, this switch is just like an all or nothing. It's basically saying, like, everything on this NIC is going to be, is not going to disturb the CPU cache, or everything on this uh, transmitted on this NIC for TCP is going to disturb the CPU cache. It's either an on or an off, and that's all you get. And. Um, I think there are, are potentially other piece, other types of hardware, uh, other kernel features, other application architectures, other protocols, other address families. All these things invite really interesting use cases um, that the existing TX no cache copy interface wide TCP only mechanism don't allow you to take advantage of. And I'm going to show you one of them right now with some really surprising performance numbers, uh, one that we use ourselves. Uh, so here's an example of a common application architecture pattern uh, you're probably familiar with. You have uh, in orange, uh, that's your computer, and in red you have your backend app, and in yellow is your reverse proxy, and they talk to each other over a Unix socket, and a client requests come in, and the basic flow, what typically happens in this architecture setup, right, is like a client request comes in, the reverse proxy reads that request, it writes it to the Unix socket, the backend app reads that request. Um, the backend app does some, I don't know, maybe makes like some queries to a database or something, generates a response, and then the backend app writes the response back to the Unix socket, the reverse proxy reads that response, and then writes it back out, and that's how you get your server response. That's like a fairly common application architecture with two things that talk to each other over a Unix socket. Um, and by doing this, there's lots of buffers being read and written, and so a lot of CPU cache is being churned. Um, even for things like plain text HTTP, where the reverse proxy doesn't really do that much, like maybe it just throws a couple headers on, and that's it. Uh, and it seems kind of wasteful to be churning through CPU cache when you don't necessarily really need to if you're just moving a body, uh, like any, you know, some HTTP response body from a backend app through a reverse proxy. Um, so I started to wonder, is there a way to do this with less data movement, thus less cache churn? And is there a way to do this for specific connections um, and for things that are more than just TCP? And the answer is, it is possible. Uh, what if you were to extend send message to allow the application to decide when a non-temporal write is necessary or not? So instead of it doing it interface wide, you just say on a specific send message for a particular socket that like this write should or should not be, uh, should, should or should not have temporal locality. Um, so I implemented that. Uh, I submitted an RFC to the mailing list. This was actually a while ago. Um, I was just got super busy, so I didn't end up like trying to push this through to actually get this merged. This was probably like, I think I submit this, when was this? June of 2022, so a couple years ago. 
Uh, this adds a new flag called message NT copy to send message to allow you to do this. And it supports more than just TCP. It supports TCP, supports Unix sockets, supports UDP sockets, and so on. And the idea behind this all is that the user app know, like the user app knows like when it will or won't need temporal locality. You support more than just TCP, and you can preserve the CPU cache contents and common application uh, architecture patterns. Um, so I'm going to show you one specific use case with like really disproportionate benefit. So plain text HTTP one uh, benefits from this like just totally disproportionately. So it makes for a good demo. Um, so imagine, uh, you know, the same diagram you had before when we decide to redesign this thing to uh, take better advantage of the CPU cache. Uh, plain text HTTP one request comes in to the reverse proxy. Uh, the reverse proxy reads that uh, request, writes it to the Unix socket, the backend app reads that request, does this processing, generates the response, right? The backend app though knows that the request is plain text HTTP one. And using the RFC that uh, I posted to the mailing list, we can avoid dirtying the cache and we can save memory bandwidth by having the backend do a send message to the Unix file descriptor, telling it to do a non-temporal copy to not disrupt the CPU cache. And so, um, sorry, the animation didn't load. This was gonna be like a step-by-step -step thing, but I'm just gonna try to talk you through it. Basically, uh, in this re-architecture, what ends up happening is the backend app does a non-temporal write to the Unix socket. The reverse proxy then uses splice to move that data out of the Unix socket into a pipe buffer, so keeping the data in the kernel, but not touching it. And then the reverse proxy will use a non-temporal write to write out whatever headers it needs to write to the client. And then it'll use splice to uh, actually take the response body and have that DMA uh, via the NIC uh, out to the client. And so you can re-architect your system to do this to minimize the amount of cache churn uh, and the amount of cache thrashing you're doing uh, by you know, copying data back and forth. And doing this has some really surprising uh, results, or at least surprising to me. Uh, but there's a couple key things here, like the backend knows the request is plain text, the backend uses a non-temporal write to the Unix socket, and uh, the reverse proxy, like I said, uses a non-temporal write for the headers and uses splice for the body. Um, and so in this particular scenario, we avoid disrupting the cache because the NT write from the backend to the Unix socket doesn't disrupt the cache. The non-temporal write from the reverse proxy to the client for the headers doesn't disrupt the cache. And the splice of the pipe buffer uh, to the client also doesn't disrupt the cache. Um, and you save, not only do you not disrupt the cache, but you also save a lot of memory bandwidth by doing this. Um, and so the CPU cache remains as underserved as possible. Hot application data stays resident. These are all good things. Um, you might be asking, like, what about TLS? And I'm going to get to some benchmark numbers in a minute that are pretty crazy looking. But um, what about TLS? So I would argue for TLS, um, you could have something similar, like the backend app could still do a non-temporal write to the Unix socket. And then when the reverse proxy is actually ready to do TLS, it can just do a regular read. And then that read will populate the cache with the data. And then you can do the TLS. And then you can do the non-temporal write uh, when you're transmitting to uh, the client. Um, that's you know a, a one possible implementation of TLS. There's lots of other different ways you can do it depending on your hardware and what you care about and so on. Um, and in the TLS case that I just showed, right, like the backend app preserves the CPU cache as much as it can. Uh, the reverse proxy wants the data in the cache so that TLS will be fast, but you can still do a non-temporal write when you do the transmit. Um, and there are lots of other cases where non-temporal flexibility, in my opinion, I think are really helpful. Like if you're using KTLS, which is like off, uh, hardware offloaded, um, you might want non-temporal writes in certain situations with Quick. It really depends on like your application, uh, the platform you're working on, what features you have, and so on. And I think like the whole point that I'm trying to make is that having a global switch that only affects TCP uh, is better than nothing, I guess. But having more fine-grained control, uh, in my opinion, m makes it possible to build like much more interesting apps. Um, so I'll give you some benchmark data when I tested this. Uh, I wrote, a, so there's a, a, a micro benchmark uh, that's floating around on the, on the internet that you can use called Unix thread and it just 
uh, measures the amount of data that two uh, processes can transfer over a socket. I modified that to uh, basically use so what ends up happening is that you run this micro benchmark and it calls fork and the parent process does a non temporal write to the Unix socket and then the child process does a splice from the Unix socket to a pipe buffer and then from the pipe buffer to dev null. And there's lots of different command line flags you can use to benchmark different sizes and use like different things. Um, and I posted the results of this actually in the RFC. So this is from the RFC. This is using just this AMD Zen 2 processor that I had um, available um, I'm setting different, uh, you know, buffer sizes, you, and you, you know, you can test whatever buffer sizes make sense for you. Um, from the RFC, just to give you like an example, this is really similar to the numbers that Tom posted originally in 2011. Um, if you take this micro benchmark and you pin it to two CPUs on this Zen 2 system that do not share an L2 cache, um, using the message NT copy method uh, results in a 43% increase in throughput. Uh, which is really similar to what Tom posted. Tom posted like this huge increase, like I think it was like 45% or so for P95 times, um, getting a sort of a similar like order of magnitude, 43% increase in throughput, which is pretty surprising. Um, and then if you try the same test, but you you know pin the parent and child process to CPUs that do share an L2 cache, uh, you get a at least with the numbers that I the buffer sizes I was testing, I got a 33% increase in throughput. Um, so that was all pretty. Interesting, like the numbers definitely seem really large and bizarre. And so it was not too surprising to me that I got this response from the mailing list when I posted this. Um, I posted this and then somebody was like, uh, somebody named Alvira, I don't, I don't know who this, this person is, but they write a lot of kernel code. And they were just saying like, you know, are you sure you're not testing like a KS hand kernel? Uh, and that, you know, and they also mentioned it in the response, which uh, was really perplexing to me was like, would it make sense to cover the mem copy side as well? And I wasn't really sure what they meant. I wasn't sure if they meant like mem copy in user land or not, um, or they meant mem copy like in the kernel or what they were talking about. But um, we'll go back to the mem copy bit in a, in a moment because I think that's actually really interesting. Um, but the micro benchmarks show a really huge improvement. But who gives a shit about micro benchmarks? Um, what about an HTTP workload? What does that look like? Um, so. An HTTP benchmark using a reverse proxy and backend architecture uh, pattern where the backend app just responds with like a response body uh, with plain text HTTP one. Um, same setup that we were that I was showing you before, right? There's just like the reverse proxy that runs, talks to the backend app over a Unix socket, and we try just benchmarking this with HTTP one. What do we get? Um, this graph is probably kind of hard to see if you're in the back, so um, I'm just I'll explain it to you in words. But basically, the baseline uh, throughput is about 170 gigabits using the normal copy mode. And then when I enabled uh, the uh, Unix, uh, you know, the NT uh, copy into the Unix socket, 170 gigabits increased. The 170 gigabit throughput increased to 245 gigabits of throughput. And you'll also notice there's like a large dent in the CPU usage graph on the top. Um, and if you look really closely, you'll see on the bottom that for baseline and TX no cache copy enabled are both there. And there's no difference when you turn on T, uh, TX no cache copy in this case. And the reason for that is because remember, we're using splice on the output path now. We're not doing a write on the output path. So enabling TX no cache copy when you're using splice on the output path doesn't do anything. And this test like verifies that that's actually what's happening. Um, so yeah, TX no cache copy on doesn't help in this benchmark because the reverse proxy is already using splice and it's not touching the data on TX. Uh, so using message NT copy does help when writing into the Unix socket because it preserves the cache and it generates less memory bandwidth traffic. Um, and just like to summarize, like in the HTTP one benchmark that I was running, I went from 170 gigabits using a normal copy to 245 gigabits using a non-temporal copy. But that's on the hardware that I was using. That was on my AMD Zen 2 machine. Your hardware might be different. You might be using an Intel machine with DDIO. And that might affect the results, because with DDIO, you can do DMA directly from the cache. So it really depends on your hardware platform, your architecture, what you're trying to do, and so on. And that, I think, just adds to the point that I'm trying to make, which is that maybe it's better for more fine-grained control over when uh, copies should be should have temporal locality or not. Maybe an interface-wide switch is not the best way to go. I don't know. Um, so what about DDIO? I just mentioned that um, 
DDO allows uh, DMA directly from the cache, thus non-temporal writes may not be useful uh, if buffers are sized proper properly. Um, this is CPU and application specific, so users should be aware that DDIO will affect their results if they try to run these benchmarks. Um, if your CPU has DDIO support, I strongly recommend reading this paper that I linked to in the, in the slides. Uh, this paper is really, really interesting, and it talks about cases where DDIO can actually work against you uh, if you have high-speed NICs. And it's a really, really, really fascinating paper. I strongly, strongly encourage you to read it if you are interested in this. Um, so if this is true in the kernel, right, that like uh, controlling non-temporal writes and controlling, uh, you know, temporal locality makes a measurable difference. Um, what about memcopy and userland? And that's what I think Alvira was asking. I could be wrong, but that's what I assumed they were asking, um, you know, when they were posting this question on the mailing list. And the answer to the question about what about memcopy and userland is actually pretty simple, which is that um, glibc has had a tunable for memcopy and memmove for a really long time. So in glibc, if a copy is above a certain size threshold, uh, glibc will use a non-temporal store instead of a regular store um, automatically. And uh, it turns out actually in 2020, uh, glibc was updated to change the threshold for AMD machines. For some reason, I don't know why, maybe like somebody at AMD can explain why, but for whatever reason, uh, AMD machines seem to be particularly sensitive to this. Um, and this is why somebody from AMD submitted this change to change the threshold on when a non-temporal uh, copy would be used on the AMD Zen architecture. Um, and stumbling on this is what sent me down the whole rabbit hole of like, well, what if we tried this in the kernel? And what if I tried this into the Unix socket and so on and so forth? And that's how I got the crazy benchmark results I got. Um, more recently, though, uh, Noah Goldstein from Intel has been investigating non-temporal rights for Memset also. Um, this is, again, in user land. And um, Noah added this tunable for non-temporal Memsets. So depending on the size of the Memset, uh, glibc will, recent versions of glibc will automatically use a non-temporal store uh, when doing Memset of certain size thresholds for particular Intel CPUs. I saw this go by in the mailing list and I emailed Noah and he was like, well, I, I work for Intel and like I, I ran these benchmarks. Um, I don't have any AMD CPUs I can test, do you? And I was like, oh, I do. So I, I tested this on some AMD CPUs and we collaborated a bit. And then I submit this change for glibc that uh, adds a tunable to glibc for AMD machines when you're doing memset, right? Like while we're just talking about memcopy, this is memset, slightly different, right? But the, the same idea uh, applies. Um, and if you're really curious, uh, Noah's been compiling this huge spreadsheet of memset performance data across lots of different CPUs. And you can see really clearly where the non-temporal threshold is for different Intel and AMD CPUs. Uh, he and I have been working together on this, where like I've been gathering data from different AMD CPUs I have access to. He's been gathering data from different Intel CPUs he has access to. And we're finding like the specific spot on where uh, you know a memset might be better if it's non-temporal or not. Uh, so anyway, in conclusion, um, I think that TX no cache copy is useful for a very narrow set of applications. Um, I think, in my opinion, that applications probably know uh, when they do or don't need temporal locality better than, it, than an administrator just saying like globally for the entire NIC, like everything is non-temporal or not. Um, glibc itself already has tunables for non-temporal rights for, me for memcopy and memset. And the micro benchmarks that I showed you show improvements um, using, uh, you know, show a performance boost when using non-temporal copies in certain application architectures. And so maybe, maybe uh, send message should be extended to allow user applications to decide if their rights should or should not have temporal locality to lots of different types of things, not just TCP sockets. And uh, that's all I had to talk about today. Um, I could take questions, but keep in mind that, uh, you know, the more questions you ask, the less lunch you get to eat, so. Um, um, I have two questions. One, um, I, did I understand correctly that you measured the improvements even without a competing application that makes better use of the cache? So just looking so, at one application that bypasses the cache? Yeah, so, uh, Sorry, can you repeat the question? That there's there's one application that by so, so the idea is to not trash the cache because mm -hmm. other data may, might make better use of the cache. 
or other applications. But you don't didn't talk about another application. You you just run the benchmark. So there was no other application, and you still see an improvement. Um, yeah. So there, there's other there's other data that that application uses that it's not necessarily transmitting to the network, like oh. like internal data that the app that the app needs, like for running its event loop or for keeping track of like connections that are coming in or whatever. So that data stays hot in the cache, uh, but the transmits uh, like to the network, you can avoid evicting data that the, like you can imagine like the event loop in this app has a bunch of state that it needs to keep track of. And you can keep that hot in the cache if you don't evict it by doing a regular copy into the, into the Unix socket. Um, but in general with our apps, we generally try to pin apps to CPUs so they have exclusive use of CPUs so we can guarantee uh, that like the cache will be hot with data that the, those applications actually need. Okay, so so I might see a, a, a more throughput if I uh, use the ETH tool command and run NetPerf or iPerf or something. And uh, you might. I mean, it it, dep it depends on the t the exact test that you're running. Uh, I mean, that's what I think Tom was showing in his original commit in 2011 uh, was just for regular TCP connections uh, that um, I, I think he was running just like TCP RR or something back then. Um, so. Presumably, if you reran the same test that he, that he was running and you turned TX no cache copy on and off, you would reproduce the results that he got. It's up to you to, de to decide whether or not that specific benchmark is like relevant for the type of application you're running or not. Okay, thank you. And the other question is, um, have you considered the uh, other uh, paths, data paths like SendFile or, or something like that? Um, yeah, there's. I've considered SendFile. There's a lot of reasons why SendFile is tricky. Uh, for a variety of reasons, but one reason uh, is, you know, with send, when you call send file, well, so first of all, the data might not be on disk, it could be in RAM, but also uh, send file, you don't know when the receiver has actually, like send file finishes and returns, but you don't know that the receiver has act all the bytes. So you don't know if you can reuse the, the, the data on, like if you can overwrite the data on disk or not. So there are complications involved with using SendFile, basically. It's not as simple, I think. Uh, but yeah, we've, I, we, like the short answer is yes, I've considered, I've considered SendFile, yes. I, I just think it's complicated. Hello, uh, so does the non-temporal uh, flag travel uh, with SKB? Is it transferred to the SKB? So if you have any BPF on egress, like C group egress or maybe TC egress, uh, they know not to pull in the SKB data by accident and crash the cache. Yeah, so I didn't make any modifications to any of that. So uh, we don't really use like a lot of stuff on the on the egress path. Um, so I mean, we have just like some basic uh, like pacing and stuff like that. But as long as like you don't touch the actual payloads, it seems to be fine. Okay, okay, but in the current RFC, you have no way to determine that from BPF context. If That's right. Yeah, 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 things. yeah. Last question. Uh, do you think that it's feasible to implement for send MMSSG, the multiple messages at once? Um, probably, yeah. I mean, I didn't, try, I didn't try that, but I could imagine that's feasible. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just curious. Thanks. Yeah. All right, thank you. Wow.